Hello, I'm Reg Bird, and I'm the pastor of Prince of Faith Lutheran Church in Calgary. I'm glad you're able to join us for this time of worship on this, this most unusual of Easter Sundays. During this time, I invite you to simply be in whatever space you need to be in. That could mean just listening. It could mean humming along to the songs. It could mean belting them out for the whole neighborhood to hear. It could also mean joining in the various spoken responses that will come up on the screen at different times. And it could mean something else, too. Later in this time of worship, there will be the opportunity to share in God's gift of Holy Communion. We may not be able to gather together physically, but we can still gather around God's Word. And we can gather as the body of Christ, regardless of physical distance, as we share in this meal. Now, if you want to share in communion on this Easter day, I'd invite you to hit pause in a moment and, and get a couple of things to set aside. First of all, some bread in whatever form, whether it's a cracker, a bun, and a cup of something. It could be wine, it could be juice, it could be water. The elements themselves are not what's critical. What makes all the difference is God's word of promise to us. So for now, if you want to hit pause and set these things aside, I'll be waiting right here when you hit play again. Something I've been thinking about is how different this time in our lives is, especially around Good Friday and Easter this year. On these days, we take the time to ponder Jesus' journey to and death on the cross, as well as the discovery made in a cemetery that first Easter Sunday, that although Jesus had died, he was alive again, resurrection, new life. And I'm wondering if maybe this year, as we're forced into isolation and physical distancing from one another, if these ponderings might take on a somewhat different or even deeper significance. I know that for me, the reality of, of death and the promise of new life have become in some way more real than what they've been before. What about you? I'll leave you to ponder that. In any case, this is Easter Sunday. And this day and what we celebrate can remind us that no matter what happens, no matter what struggles we may face, that these things don't get the last word. God does. And God's word is life. So I invite you to join me in a responsive call to worship this morning. Give thanks to God, because God is good. In God we find our strength and our salvation. We will sing glad songs of victory. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. We will not die. We will live. This is the Easter day that our God has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We worship in the, the name, name of the, the Father, and, the and of the Son, and, and of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let's take a moment and, and listen to our opening song for today, Jesus Christ is Risen Today.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Holy God, your love for us is amazing, overwhelming, undying. You came and were born among us because of love. You walked this earth with us, touching people's lives because of love. You freely gave up your life and accepted death on the cross because of love. But not even death could stop your love. You walked out of the tomb, risen from the dead, alive again because of love. God of mercy, we no longer look for Jesus among the dead, for he is alive and has become the Lord of life. Increase in our minds and hearts the risen life we share with Christ and help us to grow as your people toward the fullness of eternal life with you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The first reading we're going to hear from the Bible today comes from the book of Acts. Peter's sermon, delivered at the home of Cornelius, a Roman army officer, sums up the essential message of Christianity. Everyone who believes in Jesus, whose life, death, and resurrection fulfilled the words of the prophets, receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Then Peter replied, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. In every nation he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. This is the message of good news for the people of Israel, that there is peace with God through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after John began preaching his message of baptism. And you know that God appointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Then Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we apostles are witnesses of all he did throughout Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a cross. But God raised him to life on the third day. Then God allowed him to appear, not to the general public, but to us whom God had chosen in advance to be his witnesses. We were those who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he ordered us to preach everywhere and to testify that Jesus is the one anointed by God to be the judge of all, the living and the dead. He is the one all the prophets testified about, saying that anyone who believes in him will have their sins forgiven through his name. And our second lesson comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And here Paul describes the consequences of the resurrection, including the promise of new life in Christ to a world that has been in bondage to death. He celebrates the destruction of evil and the establishment of God's victorious rule over all. So take a listen to it. If our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in this world. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Just as everyone died because we belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. But there is an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest, then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. After that, the end will come when he will turn the kingdom over to God the Father, having destroyed every ruler and authority and power. For Christ must reign until he humbles all his enemies beneath his feet, and the last enemy to be destroyed is death.
Every year we gather together on Easter Sunday and we hear again the story of Jesus' resurrection. And as we gather, we exchange a traditional greeting. Let's try it again. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. As we celebrate, we sing songs of praise, often heavily peppered with the word Alleluia. We share in communion with one another, with all of God's people around the world, and above all, with our risen Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I think we like the idea of resurrection. Fair to say? But I wonder, is it only something that we imagine as as applying to some future time, namely after we die? Now, no question that this is a wonderful promise we find in the Bible. We find it not only in the Gospels that speak of Jesus' resurrection, but also in the writings of the Apostle Paul. In his first letter to the Corinthians, for example, Paul spends an entire chapter, chapter 15, talking about Jesus' resurrection and how we too will one day be raised to life again with him. I want to share a little bit of what he says in that letter. He writes, Let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried, and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture said. He was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James, later by all the apostles. Last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him, for I am the least of the apostles. In fact, I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle after the way I persecuted God's church. But tell me this, since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you still saying that there is no resurrection of the dead? For if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless, and your faith is useless. And we apostles will all be lying about God, for we've said that God raised Christ from the grave. But that can't be true if there's no resurrection of the dead. And if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. Now, in this letter, Paul isn't saying all that there is to say about the resurrection. Rather, he's addressing a specific issue that was of concern in the congregation, the church, in the city of Corinth. The issue was that there were some people who didn't believe that Jesus had been raised from the dead, and that consequently there was no hope for anyone else to be raised in new life after they had died. Their concern wasn't about the impact of their faith in Christ on their day-to-day lives, only about what would happen after they died. That's the issue that Paul was addressing in this letter. But I wonder if perhaps we today are facing a different issue. If perhaps we have grown so accustomed to hearing this promise of resurrection that the Corinthians' concern isn't prominent in our minds. After all, at almost every Christian funeral, we hear some of what Paul had to say about the resurrection. We hear this promise again and again of life beyond death. And so I wonder if perhaps... Our question is different. I wonder if we have so focused on the resurrection and on new life as some future reality that we've lost sight of its significance for our lives today, the lives we live on this side of the grave. We may not have any pressing questions about life with God after we die, but do we see that this promise is given to us today? Do we know and do we believe that God's promise of new life in Christ doesn't only come into play once we die, but that that new life begins now. One thing I've noticed about people, myself included, is that we sometimes have a hard time seeing what's right in front of us. We get so busy looking beyond, looking at everything else, that we can't see what's staring us in the face. In the Easter Gospel, Mary Magdalene couldn't see what was right in front of her. She'd already made assumptions about what was real and what was true. And as a result, when she came face to face with the reality of Jesus' resurrection, she almost missed it. In fact, it wasn't just Mary. The other disciples missed it too. So let's hear about what happened that day. Listen to the Easter gospel as recorded in John's account of Jesus' life. Reading from John chapter 20. 
Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. She said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there. While the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For until then, they still hadn't understood the scriptures that said Jesus must rise from the dead. Then they went home. Mary was standing outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she stooped and looked in. She saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angels asked her. Because they've taken away my Lord, she replied, and I don't know where they've put him. She turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her. Who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. Sir, she said, if you've taken him away, tell me where you put him and I'll go get him. Mary, Jesus said. She turned to him and cried out, Rabboni, which is Hebrew for teacher. Don't cling to me, Jesus said, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go and find my brothers and tell them I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene found the disciples and told them, I have seen the Lord. Then she gave him his message. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. When Mary arrived at the cemetery that morning and found the stone rolled away from the entrance to Jesus' tomb, she ran and told the other disciples. They set out running for the cemetery, and yet even when they saw the cloths that had been wrapped around Jesus' body lying there, they didn't get it. Well, one of them did. We're told that one person, quote, saw and believed. The others, not so much. This despite the many times that Jesus had told them about what would happen to him, that he would be handed over to the religious authorities, that he would be killed, and that after three days he would rise again. But Mary, I think Mary is the clearest example of someone who couldn't see what was staring her in the face. After the other disciples had seen the empty tomb, They headed back to town while Mary stayed at the tomb weeping. And then she comes face to face with two, quote, white robed angels who ask her why she's crying. She answers them because they've taken away my Lord and I don't know where they put him. Okay, now think about this for a minute. She has just had a conversation with two angels, two angels. And still it doesn't even begin to register for her. Then as she turns to leave, there's someone else standing there. It's Jesus himself, alive again, but she doesn't even recognize him. And he asks her, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? It's a voice that Mary has heard countless times before, but it doesn't click. And so she says, sir, if you've taken him away, tell me where you've put him and I'll go get him. And Jesus says, Mary. Actually, I hear it more like, Hello, Mary, you, it's me. Now, I could be wrong, but I imagine Jesus has a big silly grin plastered across his face. And finally, she's able to see, to really see Jesus who was standing right in front of her. A few minutes ago, I posed a question. Well, more of a speculation. I said, I wonder if we have so focused on the resurrection and new life as some future reality that we've lost sight of its significance for our lives today, the lives we live on this side of the grave. You see, while it's true that Jesus' resurrection, the reason for our Easter celebrations every year, impacts our lives after we die, it also has huge implications for our lives right here and right now. I'm not talking about the garbage that so many TV evangelists view about how if you just believe hard enough, God will bless you by granting you your every hope, dream, and even whim. That's a load of rubbish. What I am talking about is that Jesus was raised from the dead, and that means that Jesus is alive today, 
and he's present with us today in the midst of all the times of our lives, the good times, the bad times, and even the downright ugly times. And he comes to us not only to walk with us through all of our lives, but he comes to become part of our lives, to enter into a relationship with us, to comfort us, to teach us, to guide us, to strengthen us, to help us. In a word, to live in and live through us. To bring us the gift of new life with God right here and right now. And because he's alive, he's also present in the world around us, in the community in which we live, continuing his mission of bringing healing and wholeness to people every single day. And how does he choose to do this? Through you and me. So many religious people, though, see the goal of faith as going to heaven when I die. And they completely ignore this reality, that Jesus' life, death, and resurrection also impact our very real lives in the very real world in which we're living right now. They fail to notice that God is at work in the world around us, that God chooses to work through us. And yet even though we come face to face with this reality every single day, so often we fail to see it. It's a guy you may have heard of, a guy called Pope Francis. He had something simple and yet profound to say about the reality of God choosing to work in and through us as followers. As concerns feeding those who are hungry, he said, you pray for the hungry, then you feed them. This is how prayer works. Another individual who wrote about the Christian faith shared another important observation. He said the gospel is less about how to get into the kingdom of heaven after you die and more about how to live in the kingdom of heaven before you die. Paul, in his first letter to the Corinthians, in that passage I read earlier, said, If our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. If it's only for this life. That's what Paul said. He's assuming that the people he's writing to already know that their faith impacts their real lives in the world in which they live. For Paul, that was a given. I want to leave you with one more thought today from the Apostle Paul, this time from his letter to the Romans. In that letter, Paul writes, So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, walking around the house life. <laughs> Oops, walking around the house life. Yes, we're in isolation. Let me try that again. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work and walking around life and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings out the best in you, develops well-formed maturity in you. I hope and pray that we who claim the Christian faith today will also know this to be true, that we'll know that Jesus' resurrection means new life for us too, right here and right now, and not just when we die. I pray that when we say Christ is risen, we'll know that this means new life for us, new life that begins now. Let's try that greeting once more. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen.
invite you to join me in declaring aloud our faith, the faith of the church, using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The Prayers of the People Celebrating the victory of love over death, we offer our prayers to God, praying God of Easter, and please respond, hear our prayer. Living, loving God, you have revealed new life to our dying creation. Your love wins, God of Easter. Living, loving God, you bring your new life to us through the new life of Jesus and promise that this is who we truly are. Your love wins, God of Easter. Living, loving God, the powers with which we contend have been rendered powerless. Your love, your life, your presence proclaim our identity. Your love wins, God of Easter. Living, loving God, reassure your church of your ongoing guidance during these days of pandemic. Strengthen our faith to bridge the gaps created by our need to separate. Make us one in the living Christ. Your love wins, God of Easter. Living, loving God, your new life comes specifically to our dying world. Use your people to bring joy to those who are hopeless, to bring riches to those who are poor, and to bring healing to those who are sick, especially those we name before you now. Your love wins, God of Easter. Living, loving God, because of Easter we can live in hope. Open our eyes to see how everything has changed. Your love wins, even here, even now. God of Easter, hear our prayer. Into your hands, your gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, made known to us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. It's time for us to, to move into a different portion of this worship time, to share it together in Holy Communion. I invite you to take the, the bread and the cup that you set aside earlier and have that have that handy now. For us, it's not the element itself, the bread, the wine, whatever it may be, that matters the most. It's God's word of promise connected with it. And so for us in faith, the bread and the, and the wine that we share, for us is the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, given, shed for us. So I invite you to join me now in, in a response we declare ourselves to be Easter people. We have come to share in the table that Jesus has prepared for us. God took the bad news of sin and guilt and changed it to good news through his dying and rising for us. We are here to celebrate the good news and the presence of Christ with us. On the night when he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and he gave it to his disciples saying, say this with me. Take, Take and eat. eat. This, this is, is my body, body broken, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant written in my blood, which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. We thank you, Lord, for these gifts of bread and wine, your body and blood given in love for us. Accept us, forgive us, and heal us that we might live lives that are pleasing to you. We thank you, Lord, that you are always with us and that nothing, not even death, can get in the way of your amazing love. We pray that you would strengthen us through this holy gift of communion with you and with all of your people around the world. We ask it in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. And so take and eat the body of Christ given for you. In the body of Christ given for me. Take and drink the blood of Christ shed for you. In the blood of Christ shed for me. In this simple, simple sharing of bread and wine, our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, has himself come to you. He forgives you all your sins and empowers you to go in his name, to, to live in his love, in his grace, to live the new life that he gives you now and to share his grace and love wherever you go. May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you always in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Life-giving God, in the mystery of Christ's resurrection, you send light to conquer darkness, water to give new life, and the bread of life to nourish your people. Send us forth as witnesses to your son's resurrection, that we may show your glory to all the world. Through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. Today I want to, to offer you a benediction taken from the letter to the Hebrews. Now may the God of peace, who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood, may he equip you with all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you, through the power of Jesus Christ, every good thing that is pleasing to him. All glory to him forever and ever. Amen. Let's listen to or even sing along with one more Easter song. Thine is the glory.
So go and live in God's promise of Easter. Go and love one another in the name of our risen Lord Jesus Christ. Go and serve all people through the power of the Holy Spirit. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Now go in peace and serve the Lord. We We will. will. Thanks Thanks be to to God. God.